Sucker. I have been exploring how health, wealth, work and rest affect our happiness. Yet, I know what brings me the most joy and most heartache are my relationships with my friends, family and my own mind. I'm curious about how we impact each other's happiness for better or for worse. What turns a crowd into a community? How can the power of relationships help us to achieve happiness for our tribe, our people, and our nation? It's been said that happiness begins with you. Our relationship with our minds has a huge effect on our happiness. Your inner voice can be your chief critic or your best cheerleader. My mind is busy and restless. I go for yoga and you know how at the end of the class they make you lay down, they make you clear your thoughts and I just have a problem clearing my thoughts. I can't, like it's just racing all the time. I've noted how mindful meditation has helped others deal with anxious thoughts. That has inspired me to practice mindfulness to see if it will boost my happiness. Dr. Kathir developed the course that I'm trying. He calls it Mindfulness-Based Wellbeing Enhancement, and he says it could improve my relationship with my thoughts. I think a lot of my life, like, it just doesn't stop either with thoughts or, you know, just me physically. It's very hard to kind of wind down at the end of it all. You can't expect a highway to be not having any vehicles, right? Okay. So in the same way, we can't expect our mind to be without any thoughts. Yeah. Instead of trying to clear those thoughts, what's going to happen in this training is you learn to accept uh, what's happening in your mind. In that sense, you learn to respond to it instead of react to it. Okay, I could get with that. Yeah, I think so. Although it might be, there's too many cars in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so for the beginning, you can go by the side first. Because I want you to feel the whole mm -hmm. uh, sensation of your body, right? Becoming aware of whatever. My body, every single part had so much tension in it. And when she said to release it, you could feel that release. It was almost like a <sighs> sort of feeling. Mindfulness seems promising, but how can we tell if it makes me happier? Dr. Kathir wants me to journal about my subjective well being. He also has a more objective way to measure my well being. So, Muna, this is a ear sensor. Right. Now, this is a sensor that picks up your, your heart rhythms. So the first thing is for you Dr. Kathir compares my heart rate at rest with when I'm asked to think of something stressful. Look at the spike. I felt a shift in emotion, but I didn't realize yeah. that. People say the heart doesn't lie. <laughs> yeah! Oh my goodness! So Muna, after eight weeks of mindfulness training, we will do this measurement one more time to see if there is any change in the way your heart responds to the training. Not trying to control your breath in any way. After eight weeks of mindfulness training, today is my last session with my trainer, Aifa. Closing your eyes, and letting your feet falling away from each other. And slowly bringing your attention to your breathing. After working on some of the practices, it helped me just be aware of my emotions, assess how I want to respond to it, so that I don't stress myself out even further. I'm a lot more open to telling people how I feel in that present moment and telling them, you know, how, how grateful I am. The data on my heart rate also indicates that I am calmer than before. 
resting heart rate also tells us how, how your body is actually functioning and how relaxed it is. Again, you can see that your resting heart rate is, the trend shows that it has become lower and lower. This is really quite interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Incredible, yeah. But why is my heart affected by a practice that begins in my mind? How does mindfulness change our brains? Just look at the cross and do not think about anything in particular. Do not move ahead and do not fall asleep, yeah? Researchers at the National University of Singapore Centre for Sleep and Cognition have been imaging the brains of undergraduates when they are at rest and when they are given certain tasks to assess how mindful they are. So participants who are able to uh, make as little mistakes as possible during these 10 minutes, uh, we classify them as uh, participants who are high in mindfulness trait. Researchers found that students high in mindfulness traits could cycle between brain functions more quickly, which suggested that they had greater awareness of their mental state. So cycling faster simply has to do with, again, I would say awareness. And because of that, we're able to more quickly do something or to let go of the stressful thoughts and sensations. And what mindfulness training does is that it helps us to get back control of our own minds. It helps us to become less stressed, that it helps us to pay more attention to the good experiences and the good times and be able to savour them more and so increase our happiness. Our brains are vital to our happiness and well-being. I was awakened to that fact when my mother was diagnosed with a rare form of dementia. With frontotemporal dementia, it affects more of your ability to form sentences or, you know, your, your ability to just have a conversation. Did Ziad come over earlier on? She was she was no. It was about five years ago when she was first diagnosed with dementia. It was difficult. I was just stunned, like I didn't know what to feel. I was so inspired by the fact that she was still kind of cheery because if she's there being strong, being positive about it, I'm like, yeah, okay, there's, there's no need for me to, to, you know, be dramatic or be emotional about it. Beautiful. Yeah. Hi. I admire my mom's cheerfulness. People with dementia commonly face depression as they grapple with cognitive decline. In Singapore alone, we have about 100,000 people with dementia and another 300,000 people with pre-dementia. Professor Nagindran is the director of the Lee Kong Chian School of Medicine's Dementia Research Centre. From a neuroscience perspective, I think when we talk about a healthy and a happy brain, it is when all the structures crucial for happiness is intact. So limbic system has been found to be one of the key areas in the brain that regulates mood and behaviour. So the limbic system mainly involves the hippocampus, the amygdala, and how it is connected to the prefrontal cortex. So when you have any injury to the limbic system, you're likely to have both mood changes in the form of depression, as well as memory changes in the form of dementia. The other aspect is the chemical aspect. Neurotransmitters are chemicals, how neurons or brain cells communicate one, with one another. So we need the right balance of these chemicals so that the neurons can talk to the, each other in a friendly way, so you become heavy. Chemical neurotransmitters can affect our happiness. For example, dopamine is known as the feel-good hormone. It's part of our brain's reward system and is responsible for giving us a sense of pleasure and is crucial to our motivation. Serotonin helps us regulate our mood as well as sleep and appetite. Hormonal changes, stress and diet can influence the levels of these neurotransmitters. There are also some things that are not within our control. Strokes can result in the uh, levels of serotonin, level of dopamine going down. And the other one is dementing conditions like Alzheimer's disease. Happiness could slow down the dementia because when you are happy, the chemical balance in the brain is right. What a workout we had today. <laughs> Our brain's pleasure and reward system is often a target of media and marketing companies. 
At the Wee Kim Wee School of Communication and Information, Associate Professor Edson Tandok has been studying the effects of social media on us. They're designed um, in a way that uh, they will make us stay and spend more time. So if, for example, if I see this video after 15 seconds, I see another video. Once we like something, the algorithm gives us more of the same thing. Novelty appeals to our evolutionary thirst for discovery. It stimulates our brains to generate dopamine, a neurotransmitter associated with pleasure and happiness. But Edson found a direct link between using social media and depression in his study. So we found that it's like a cycle where the more time you spend on Facebook, uh, the, the more likely for you to also experience symptoms of depression, which then increases um, your use of social media. So we found that people who spend a lot of hours on Facebook are also more likely to feel that others on Facebook seem to have better lives than us, you know, some people are traveling, are posting photos of, of the food they're eating. We compare ourselves with others. That's just human nature. The thing is, Facebook makes it easier for us to compare. And this feeling of envy would then lead them to experience uh, feelings of depression at a later time. Brian Tan found that spending time on social media was detrimental to his mental wellness. I had sleeping and breathing problems for a while and I went to see a doctor um, and that was resolved and after a few weeks I realized that um, I was spending maybe a fair amount more time than I wanted to on social media where really what I really wanted to do was to just get out there, do stuff, um, go for a run, enjoy the park, meet my dad, meet my friends. For the sake of his happiness, Brian Tan swore off most forms of social media. You won't find him on Facebook, Instagram or TikTok. When you're on social media, you're consuming a lot of information and your mental space is just cluttered. When I got off social media, there was a lot of like quiet in my mind and it helped me to think clearer and more alone time allowed me to contemplate on, on things that were important to me. Social media and smartphones can distract us from the present moment and stop us from being mindful. A better relationship with our mind will boost our happiness. But what about our relationships with others? Friends and family bring both joy and stress and can be such a mixed blessing. Here. The isolation of COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns impacted the mental health of people around the world. It reminded us how vital relationships are to our happiness. We are all social creatures and we need people around us. In fact, there are studies out there stating that the pain we feel from social rejection is as great as physical pain. Oh. Pain. Sea breeze. Please make me feel soothed. To better understand how social isolation affects our happiness, I speak with clinical psychologist Shemaine Wong. Research has linked social exclusion and loneliness to a whole host of physical and mental health conditions, including things like hypertension, heart disease, obesity, depression, anxiety, cognitive decline, and even dementia. And conversely, people who report that they have friends and family they can turn to in times of trouble, uh, they tend to have better health and longevity. Reflecting on whom our greatest supporters are is a way to boost our well-being. Who is the person you know will always be there for you? And I chose to showcase my dad. Who is 
the person you talk to when you are worried, when you are down? My closest friends. Who is the person that is hardest to be away from? My mom. They're all connected and they fill my heart. <laughs> when you think about enjoying life, a lot of times it's with other people. Our relationships can be a catalyst for helping us to achieve our goals. Your partner or your friend can be that person who encourages you. So our relationships can be a source of support that not only makes us happy, but also contributes to our growth as a person, and that means flourishing. Having such strong social support from my friends and family may be a reason I don't feel much pressure to get married. I'm part of a growing trend. In a survey of Singaporean youth in 2021, only half of singles felt that marriage was important, and less than half felt that having children was important. But in a more traditional society, like this village in Bali, getting married and having kids seems vital to their happiness. With Linda, she recently got married during COVID-19 and then she has a 14-month-old baby and I asked her if she was happier then and now and she said it's a different sort of happiness. Sekarang saya bahagia karena saya sudah memiliki keluarga, sudah memiliki anak yang menjadi pelengkap hidup saya gitu. Sedikit kebahagiaan lah yang Tuhan berikan kepada saya. Kalau di kampung kawin itu penting banget ya. Kenapa? Karena kita itu membutuhkan keturunan. Keturunan itu sangat penting bagi orang-orang kampung kayak, kayak di sini itu keturunan penting banget. Kalau nggak, misalnya nih kalau ada orang yang belum nikah, maaf ya, kalau ada yang orang belum nikah terus pu belum punya keturunan, itu banyak orang yang hujat gitu. Kenapa belum punya baby kayak gitu? Masih sih berjalan yeah. sekarang kayak gitu. My fear of, you know, getting married, for example, and having my own family is because of the financial burden that comes with having a family, uh, raising a kid, and I think because that's just the way Singapore is, you know, it's expensive. analyzing lots of studies about couples who've just had babies. Life satisfaction tends to drop, but emotions can actually increase. Having happy moments and feeling, feeling joy. So it depends on the aspect of happiness that you're looking at, right? Having children is an important source of meaning for many parents. Um, so, you know, it, it's, the effects are com com complicated. And then this is my eldest. She is beautiful. She's nice. Dr. Lim Hong Hui is a mother of children with special needs. Even though she's a trained pediatrician, she says she's found it hard raising her kids. My kids, um, they are not easy. I have three kids. Two of them, the eldest and the youngest, have autism and ADHD. And the one in the middle, you know, middle child syndrome. I get intimidated with having children is because, you know, it's, it's a commitment, you know, it's not just a fish or a plant, yeah. you know, it's just bringing up someone and I think that that scares me. Did you, did you ever feel like that at any point? I kind of realised how scary it is, especially when they have special needs. But at the point when I had kids, it, it was a decision because I know that I have enough love to give. Having children, it's a choice, but it's a choice that, you know, it's not like you go to um, Shopee or Lazada, you, you order this colour, that colour, this shape, this size, and then no good can return, no, no. Uh, once you come, means come, and then yeah. <laughs> you just have to accept. Whatever comes, you accept. 
to love it unconditionally. Whatever turns out actually is not in your control, you know? So ultimately, does parenting give you joy? When you count all in, the net is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does give me joy, you know. I will look back and I realise that what I remember is not the sad moments, not the tough moments, but happy moments. And that keeps me going. How can caregiving bring us happiness? I found caregiving challenging, especially when it was first thrust upon me when my mother developed dementia. Yay! <laughs> Beautiful! It was hard to come to terms with. I think there was a lot of struggle with that. That there are going to be days where you feel like a failure, that you feel like, oh, I don't want to do this, this is difficult. But I think it does give our relationship a bit more meaning. It gives me some sort of purpose, I think. You know, like, I think when I was younger, <laughs> when I was first starting out with work, like, all I cared about was work, but then suddenly there's a lot more quality to why I'm here, to, you know, why I keep going. Yeah. Patrick Lim and Josephine Ho have been married for almost 40 years and have been through many ups and downs together. I have breast cancer. That was in year 2005 and uh, it was tough. At the time I was like uh, trying to be strong and yet, you know, emotionally inside me is like <laughs> a wretch. <laughs> and so he was there by my side, la, you know, to encourage me. At that point in time, our three daughters were still very, very young, you know, and uh, thoughts, of course, thoughts came to mind. If uh, I lost my wife, uh, uh, who, uh, who's going to um, uh, take care of my three daughters? And um, how am I going to go through um, uh, these moments um, without her and uh, without my mom? Two is better than one. I think uh, without him, I may miss, be missing out on something, you know? I certainly, one thing, I wouldn't be the Patrick that I am today if I had not settled down with Josephine to stand by me in good times and bad times. So this is where uh, the cliché says, we complete each other. When you look at how happy people are before they get married and how happy they are after marriage, well-being goes up and then after a couple years ago, back down to where it was. Right? They don't become less happy, but they, they sort of return to their baseline. But that said, um, you know, when you look even further over time, people's well-being tends to decline as they age. It declines a little slower for people who are married than for people who are not married. Um, and that might have something to do with um, having that social support. The social support that marriage and family provides leads to happiness. But the Singaporean family is living further apart and more Singaporeans are choosing not to marry. How can we keep social support from declining? Professor Pauline Strawn is a sociologist who has studied how the Singaporean family has evolved over the last half century. We used to think of family as under the same roof, but now we think of family as, oh, across several blocks, right? Um, within a 10-minute drive, right? And then you have those who are singers, right? And when they think family, they think of their best friends. So maybe housing policies, right, should reflect that, you know, functionality and allow friends to apply for a flat together, right? and so that they can be each other's social support and they can grow old together and they can age, you know, in place, safely, right, amongst loved ones. Our happiness depends not only on the social support of our immediate family and friends, but of our community too. How much can our wider community affect our happiness? B.
busy Singapore, it can be hard to see the thousands of people around us as being our community. Instead, we tend to view them as competitors and threats. According to evolutionary psychologist Dr. Norman Lee, crowded cities stress us out because our brains have only evolved to handle a limited number of relationships. We, uh, as humans, lived in small villages of about 50 to 150 or so people for millions of years. And so our brain only evolved to process, to keep close track of groups of that size. So in a small ancestral tribe of 150 people, they knew each other very well, they helped each other out all the time, and they had to do it back and forth. Many Singaporeans used to live in close-knit villages called kampongs. But the kampongs were cleared before I was born, so I've only heard about the so-called kampong spirit. To experience kampong life, I'm visiting a village in Bali. Preparations are underway for a festival called Galungan. My first stop is Ongok's ancestral home. Hi, Ongok. Hello, Mona. Okay. Ongok has invited me to make a festive decoration called Penjor, together with his mother and family. Potong gini saja. Oh, okay. Ah, I see, yeah, I see. They make me feel included. So that's the side. When everything was done, we put it up all together. We stood there and looked at it together with the moon and the stars, and it was just so amazing to just be part of that. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> It's the first day of Galungan, a Balinese holiday celebrating victory of good over evil. And the whole village is busy with festivities. To me, it feels like Hari Raya morning, where everyone in the family just comes together. It's very important for them to show gratitude, to give thanks to their faith, and then at the same time also pray for the family's happiness. After making offerings and praying at their family temples, many will meet in the main village temple. Their shared faith and culture bonds the community. Ati Galungan itu kita bisa bertemu sama keluarga juga, sama keluarga yang tinggal di kota, yang tinggal jauh dari dari kampung. Kita bisa ngumpul. Feeling like you're part of something that's bigger than yourself, whether that's a group of people. Whether it's a culture, so feeling like you're part of a community is actually a source of meaning. Some of that has to do with religion. Many of these societies are quite religious. Daddy. Ongo has lived in cities and even lived abroad in Switzerland with his wife's family. But he says he's happiest in the village. Saya tahu tetangga, saya tahu semua orang saling sapa itu masih bagus kalau di di kampung. Saya suka kampung karena ada community. Iya, iya. Kalau mau mencari kebahagiaan, yang pertama itu keluarga, teman, tetangga itu harus kita artinya saling respect. Kalau bagi saya. Finland, the world's happiest country, the Midsummer Festival bears some resemblance to Galungan as it also celebrates light overcoming darkness. When the sun hardly sets and the nights no longer go dark, it's time to celebrate Midsummer's Day in Finland. Midsummer occurs during the summer solstice, which is also the longest day of the year. 
think that's really significant for us because when it's dark, it's so dark and it's, it lasts for such a long time. Um, well, we Joanna Nilland, a Helsinki-based so we writer um, and photographer, shares with me the significance of midsummer to the Finns. In December, when you have the winter solstice, when you have the shortest day. So people are kind of counting the days, you know, from that down to midsummer, which is just the celebration of summer and and light and warmth and everything green that we've been waiting for, you know, all these months. And that's kind of a, a big occasion for a party. <laughs> And it's just so many people from different walks of life coming together. And the Finns really just love the simple things in life. And you're just having fun. Yeah, yeah. You just can't help but join in. <laughs> Midsummer was a pagan festival to celebrate good harvest and fertility. It was then adapted as a Christian holiday, and the tradition fosters Finnish community and national identity. Community celebrations are important because they create these shared experiences where people can be together and they can enjoy good times together. These kind of experiences are an important part of forging a common identity, right? To feel like we, we all have something in common. When I joined in community festivals in Bali and in Finland, I felt like part of a tribe. But how can I revive the old kampung spirit in my community? It's early morning in the Singaporean heartlands of Topayo. And at Agape Village, the kitchen is bustling. This is your first time here? Yeah. I'm helping volunteers to prepare nutritious soup for seniors in the community. The share initiative aims to improve the nutrition and fitness of seniors through familiar communal activities, like sharing a pot of soup and group exercise. We see the interaction between science, building strength, building bone, and building bonds in the relationships that they build with others in the community. I'm out to stepping. One, two, a lot of nice friends here. And they are all very friendly. I love it here, just like my old home. Last time to have egg and pain, after this one you find much better. Really, it's very good. I think the essence is in the word sharing. I mean, we could all have a bowl of soup on our own. We could still be unhappy. But if I were having a bowl of soup with you, I wouldn't do this and not talk to you. Now, when we become friends, I matter to you and you matter to me. And there is a continual exchange of happiness. So it could actually be sharing a pot of happiness, literally. Oh, I love that yeah. so much. When I look at the participants, the joy in their face, I feel very happy. Yeah. Uh, I feel the love that I have given is worthwhile. Yeah, it's always worthwhile. A little bit that we give back to society doesn't mean much at all. Seeing it. them happy, we they it. walk out of this place and we really enjoy it. So you find joy in giving joy to Yes, of them. course, Lots of course. Of yes, yeah. yes, yes. Immensely, immensely, yeah. yes. My day spent at Share Apart makes me realize that joy comes through sharing a helping hand and working towards a common good. We're indeed happier and stronger together. After a gloomy pandemic, bouncing back to achieve happiness will take resilience from the community, the nation, and from within. The pandemic reminded me that suffering is part of life. When things go wrong, we experience negative emotions like grief, anxiety and sadness. These negative emotions can seem like a drag. Come on, you're always trying to make Muna sad. I can't help it, I'm part of Muna's emotions. But authentic happiness can embrace diverse emotions and pain. 
when somebody has, has experienced something terrible, by all means, they have the right to be devastated. They have the right to, to feel every pain of that emotion based on what they've gone through. But the question of resilience is, okay, after we've experienced that pain, um, now how do we move forward? Yen Lu Chao lost his only son to manic depression and suicide 13 years ago. October 22nd, 2009, 10, 10.30 p.m. at night, we got a call from the school. They said, who, the, who would be calling our landline at 10.30 at night? So it was the director. He said, well, we found our son's, your son's body in a parent's suicide. It was unreal. First thing we said uh, was disbelief, right? it was denial. We said, maybe this was a mistake. Uh, maybe the police had made a mistake. Maybe, maybe the school had made a mistake. Maybe God had made a mistake. But next morning, we went to see him, we claimed his body. Of course, we had to go and face the reality. He was sick for a while, but you know, this is like really, really hit home. Uh, you can imagine it's a very dark and difficult time for us. And you talk about, you know, going through the storm, being in the rain. How did you find that resilience to keep going? And our son was actually, when he was alive, he was a very caring and compassionate person. Even when he was sick, he once told us, Mom and Dad, wouldn't it be nice if we can make a difference in someone's life? And the only way I feel what I can heal is when I can also heal other people. Something very strong, very... Yen Lu and his wife Yi Ling turned their grief into a powerful force for mental wellness. They started Over the Rainbow, an initiative to help youth foster mental wellness through community support, education and outreach. In its 10th year, Over the Rainbow made happiness its key theme. Our hearts were broken into a million pieces when this happened to us we thought we'd never, never heal again. But something magically happened, I think. People can bounce back, not just bounce back. It's about falling down, come back and stronger. And then you can start flying. Before you can walk maybe, but right? <laughs> now you can start flying. Put your hand on your heart. For some people, being able to deal with these difficult experiences is showing that they have inner strength, that they've grown as a person. There can be some benefits to happiness and well-being, uh, but it comes through growth. Oh, oh, oh. Ha, ha, ha. A growth mindset views failure as a temporary setback and an opportunity to learn and further develop. Adopting a growth mindset cultivates resilience. You just have to visualize yourself that you deserve to be happy. This experiment will test how mindsets affect children's motivation to take on challenges like these puzzles. You have four minutes to do as many puzzles as you can. Okay, let's go. We had two different groups. One group of children received praise for being clever, which is a fixed trait. Wow, you did really well. You must be really clever. Um, maybe. <laughs> the other group received feedback that they had done well because of their hard work, which is a growth trait. Wow, you did really well on these puzzles. You must have worked really hard on them. Data collected from the experiment shows that 57% out of the children who were praised for their intelligence chose to work on easier puzzles. While 100% of the children who were praised for their efforts chose to do harder puzzles, which reflect a growth mindset. How did you find these problems? I feel like if I practice even more, I would do a lot better. Excellent. So when we praise someone for their effort, they're more likely to think that they can work hard on something and learn and grow from the experience. So even when they don't do so well on a task, they will be more resilient and they will think that, hey, you know what, I can learn from this and I can get better if I keep working hard at it. 
resilience doesn't just benefit individuals. Resilience can help a country grow stronger and happier. The Finns have a stoic resilience and bravery that they call Sisu. It has helped them overcome the odds and punch above their weight. In a nation of only 5.5 million people, Finland has produced multiple champions in Formula One and World Rally Championships, beating most other nations on the win rate by population. So what is behind Finland's success rate in motorsports? Is it genetics, environment, or the unique Finnish concept of Sisu? To find out what Sisu is, I speak with Joanna Nilen. She wrote the book Sisu, The Finnish Art of Courage. Well, Sisu is a kind of a quintessentially Finnish concept that stands for a mixture of resilience and courage and tenacity, perseverance perhaps, and even stubbornness. We've lived under very harsh conditions. For like many centuries, people have to survive basically in, in winter time. And not just to survive, but to thrive and to raise families and to raise crops and, and all those things. When we were attacked by the Soviet Union, it's called the, the Winter War. We are a very small country, you know, just five million people. And the Soviet Union was this huge, massive world power with all of the military strength that they had. And we stuck it out despite all the odds. And I think people were wondering that what is this quality, you know, that gives this tiny nation the courage to stand up against this huge enemy. It's partly that idea that, that you can't just let the circumstances decide for you, that you have to, to decide what you're going to do and you have to sort of win over your circumstances. I'm left wondering how resilient my country is. Dr. Yip Wanfen has studied the role of resilience in how Singapore handled the initial phase of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020. A prestigious medical journal published her team's findings in an article entitled Building Community Resilience Beyond COVID-19, The Singapore Way. So what did your team find out about the community resilience in Singapore? So within our neighbourhood, we have seen individuals stepping up uh, to strap um, sanitizers in the lift. And there were also a lot of homemade posters to cheer people up, to encourage them that we can walk through this together. Mm -hmm. We also saw a lot of people giving uh, free masks. Mm -hmm. And you and know it's from someone in the neighbourhood, yeah. right? So it feels even more special. Yeah, it's yeah. like where the circuit breaker was going to be extended. Oh, and it, no. was, yes. it was devastating, right? My neighbour walked past and we had the opportunity to just chat, um, chat with each other. And, Do you hear the latest <laughs> news? And then this, this quick chat made each other feel a bit better. Mm -hmm. So during circuit breaker, it was also when they celebrated Hari Raya. Yeah. We put up some little lights in our corridor. So it made the entire environment more festive. So we encourage children to do some art at home and just showcase it and we paste motivational notes on each other's um, art saying, oh, I love your artworks. <laughs> it's investing in our relationship with our neighbours and they are really the nearest source of support and resource that we can tap on in difficult times. The sense of social, I think, connectedness and social cohesiveness, I think we should continue to build on what we have mm -hmm. so that when we meet another pandemic, we know we are, you know, ready to face it together. As Singapore emerges from the pandemic, Stronger Together is the theme of the National Day Parade in 2022. The Soka Gakkai Association's performance depicts a powerful message about resilience. The key message that we are trying to show, because perhaps we can even view struggles as opportunities for us to grow. We hope that they can gain joy from overcoming their struggles. It was today that I saw, you know, so many people from different walks of life really just come together and there is such unity. The pride and joy I feel comes to a climax when we start reciting the National Pledge. Happiness! Prosperity! 
Today was the first day I actually put thought when I recited the pledge. I think because we're on this journey to achieve happiness, it meant a lot more. And to be saying it amongst so many Singaporeans, the pledge suddenly had a lot more meaning. And I realised, huh, there is so much community spirit right here at home, you know. This whole journey of a show, I think it opened up my eyes to so many different perspectives, so many people's struggles and wins. I still hold on to the belief that happiness means that you are content and that you are grateful to see the good in your life and be okay with the challenges that come with it. I realise is that there's no one formula to finding happiness and I think you just got to trust yourself and trust that, you know, that's life and it is always bringing you somewhere and it's always teaching you something.